Good morning, ladies. Our presenter for this morning is currently a lecturer at the University of the, at the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of the West Indies. She lectures in cultural studies. She obtained her Bachelor's of Arts in History with honors, of course, at the University of the West Indies, as well as her PhD in history at the University of the West Indies. Today, our lecturer is none other than Dr. Candio Mitchell Hall. Please make her feel welcome, ladies. All right, thank you very much, Thorpe. Over to you, Dr. Mitchell Hall. Greetings, students, and it's really a treat to, to talk to you today about the Grenada Revolution um, by using the past paper approach as an exact uh, strategy. But, you know, let me just thank your teacher, Mr. Hall, Mr. O'Neill Hall. And students, this is no secret, um, you know, so let me just, because I'm trying to help you to connect the dots uh, when it comes to the event that the Grenada Revolution was. So let me start with this um, connection here as well. Mr. Hall is my husband um, and, uh, you know, the presenter made a note that we, um, that, you know, I studied history and, and so on when we met at university. Um, so it's, it's really great to, to get to meet you and to, to hear from you because this session is really a workshop. And by, by that, I mean that we'll be engaging in um, question and answers and of course your input is going to be important so i know that you're tired and you're at the end of the semester virtually or you want it to be the end of the semester it's early in the day but i just wanted to stretch so just stretch right now i can't see whether you're gonna do it right but i want you to stretch just stretch right stretch 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 to the to the roof to the ceiling so that you can you know just loosen up a bit um, so that we can begin. So what are we talking about today, students? We're talking about uh, the Grenada Revolution. And I know that you already have uh, the prerequisite uh, um, knowledge concerning the Grenada Revolution. Well, approaching the content that you will need for the exam through past papers will allow you to sharpen your focus. So what it will do is that it will underscore areas that you need to sharpen in your presentation um, that you will prepare for, for the exam. So let's just begin by talking about strategy for tackling the question. And that is even before you get into the exam room. So students, the first strategy is that you have to ensure that you understand the historical context and time, right? So I just kind of want to get where you are concerning um, what was happening in Grenada at the time that led to a revolution, right? So what's the historical context, students? And I, I don't want you to think long and hard. I want your instinctive, intuitive, or impulsive responses um, to these questions. What was happening at the time that would give impetus, uh, give rise to a revolution? We're talking about the 1970s. Anybody remembers? What was the climate like? What was the historical context? Don't fight. Let me see what I'm seeing in the chat. Um, somebody's having an issue with their mic, so I'm, I'm seeing that. But the rest of you, what was happening in Grenada at the time? Anybody remembers? There was a lot of um, political protests because of, if I remember correctly, like U.S. involvement. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, the U.S. was being very enough as usual, and mm -hmm. jumping that did not concern them. Right. And kept trying to basically enforce their own laws and regulations on the, you know, Grenadians, I think I pronounced that right. And basically that caused for a bit of unrest in the country because 
they were basically trying to run the country as if it was their own. All right, so we have a, a very intelligent answer here um, that the, the US were, <laughs> the students said through enoughness, <laughs> trying to impose their ideology on Grenada. So during that period, we had that, that, that um, involvement of the US and we will see how the US would involve themselves even more. But students, the Grenada Revolution, of course, would emerge from a colonial-like situation where the, after independence and during the independence period, the prime minister, who would be the first prime minister of independent Grenada, would continue along a colonial, neo-colonial path. And by that, we mean that he would be quite oppressive and he would stifle the economic progress of the people. So instead of a disruption, a break from the colonial experience of the people, and students, when we think about the colonial experience, we're talking about high unemployment, and this is giving you a general idea of the condition right that give rise to revolution high unemployment high illiteracy we're talking about poor social conditions and we talk about a, a social space what should come to mind right should be your school your hospitals um conditions road work uh, and so on these were in a deplorable state so instead of a son of the soil making inputs into the nation that would reflect a new decolonized state that would bring progress to the people whether economically socially or politically they saw the continuation of um, the colonial experience and we're going to talk about that shortly i want you to have a fast vision of the event and by that i mean a beginning a middle and an end in other words you have to be able to connect the story so the first thread that i gave you was that the grenada revolution was an insurrection that is how it is it has often been called whereby the conditions that gave birth to it reflected the colonial experience. This is one. So you already have a clear vision that the people were being oppressed, they were being suppressed, their living conditions were poor, and the new nation, right, that should have emerged in this independent period was a reflection of the colonial experience. So that is one, right? But you now have to understand the events that would give birth to the revolution. One, conditions of the revolution itself. So their achievements, their fallouts. And then of course, you have to understand as well, whether this revolution is ongoing or whether it came to an end, right? So you need a far-sighted vision of the event to help you connect the dots. In other words, students, you need a story. Right? Anybody ever came to you and, and give you a story about something and to your mind, parts of the story, missing parts, as we would say? Yes. Yes, I am telling you, I've heard some stories and um, I can tell and I would say, mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm not buying that because something wrong with that. This, I can't accept this story wholesale. Well, when you're preparing for your exam and it's an event and the, the thing about an event is that I know that students tend to shy away from it, but because it has a, an infrastructure, it means that the beginning will never change. So what caused the revolution, the trigger will never change, right? The events of the revolution itself would never change and how it ended would never change. It means that if you have this in your grasp, this understanding, you'll be able to tackle a question like this, no matter how it comes, because they will either ask about how it started or why it started, what influenced it, the factors that cause it, 
or they will spin it in some kind of way. Why were Grenadians opposed to Eric Gary? Why were they unhappy to Eric Gary, uh, unhappy about Eric Gary's government, etc.? In the middle, what were the achievements of the revolution? How did the revolution fail? What were the fallouts, right? Or the criticisms? And then, of course, how did it end? And its ending involves the US involvement. You see, so once you have this kind of narrative thread in your head, you'll be able to tackle a question like this, no matter how it comes. You have to read the question carefully. Read the question at least twice. I think some of the fallings of students involve um, their anxiety to, to, to get on with the exam. You kind of want to be prepared from before and you kind of want to calm down before so that by the time you get there, you know, okay, this is the matter at hand. I'm already prepared. I'm going to read my question carefully so that I can understand the nuances. And by nuances, I mean what is implied. Because sometimes you have a question that is very complex. It is not as straightforward as it appears. And you want to be able to recognize all of the complexities. And by complexity, we don't mean that it is difficult. You are able to tackle it because you have a clear vision of the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of, of this particular event, right? It, as a student, I loved event questions. And so I, 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 I attended to look out for those because it, to me, it is a clear strategy in preparing to answer a question. I need to know the factors that give rise to this event. I need to know the course of it, what occurred within the event itself, and when the event ended, why it ended, right? You want to underscore and highlight the key terms of the question. We're going to look at some of that shortly. Good. And of course, uh, you need to be able to manipulate your content. So then I'm going to show you three questions that are similar. And I'm going to show you how we're going to use the same information, right? But we're going to manipulate it differently. So there are some content that are so malleable, they can fall within the political theme or social or economic. I'm going to show you what I mean. You have to pay attention to the weighting of the question. You know that your questions are worth 25 marks and there are some sections that might be worth more. So the section that is worth more, you have to do more, right? You have to analyze more and you have to present more information. I know that one of the don't fall, but you will tell me in a while whether you fall in victim, right? I feel that when it comes to the question of waiting, that students fall victim um, to this in the exam because you may have a question that is worth five marks while there is another that is worth eight and then you may have another that is worth 12 and that that amounts to 25 marks you cannot spend all of your time on the question that is worth five marks so you have to decide this is worth five marks two points this question is worth eight marks, three, four points. And the one that is worth 12 marks, you know that you need to develop uh, more points and to present your evidence and your examples. So then just to get to know you and to, to hear you um, a bit, you know, have you ever fallen victim to this waiting issue where you paid more attention to a smaller waiting? than a section of the question that was weightier, that it carried more marks, more weight. Anybody? Yeah, because I always have the, it's not always a problem, but like sometimes I'll overwrite just a little bit. But um, since my what, grade 10 exam, I've been practicing now. And now I know that's so kind of like concise, you know, look at the marks and everything, you know? Yeah, this is who who just spoke a while ago. Kiana. This is excellent, Kiana, because you see sometimes, and it is really a trick as an examiner myself, you may, and the examiner may ask a question, and it is a question that is widely known, you see? And for that question, that question may carry the least amount of weight within um, that particular theme. 
Yeah, so a question like what caused the, the Grenada Revolution or who caused the Grenada Revolution? You, you may have all of the answers. You may, have, you, you may be able to conceptualize them based on themes. You might say, okay, we're gonna look at the political, the economic and the social, but that, that's just five marks. And then when you get to the other part of the, of, of the question, they may want to know now about the US justification for invading Grenada. But because you had like question one that carried the least amount of weight, it is not that you cannot tackle question two. It is that the time run out because you would have about 45 minutes or so to tackle one question. And I know that you have two hours to tackle three questions. And students, trust me, I am happy that Kiana mentioned that she, she is practicing because I want to tell you that there is nothing that you would engage in in this life that you would get just like that from the very beginning, right? You, you would have to learn by trial and error. But within the exam situation, you do not want to have to learn by trial and error. And this is why tackling past paper questions and the past paper approach is so effective, right? It's so effective. It allows you to mitigate all of the little errors that we make because of time time run out good that was an excellent um anecdotal example there um you know krishna excellent i hope i'm i i've gotten the name correctly um outline your um, wait excuse me miss miss before you move on Miss, yeah. um, you mentioned something about like eight marks or so. Miss, I feel like when you see a question inside valid nine marks, you can easily say, okay, I'm going to like have three points or you can kind of understand the marking scheme of the person that's going to like, mark your paper. Mm -hmm. Miss, but when something is like um, seven marks, eight marks, or like a number that throws you off or even mm -hmm. five marks, how do you go about answering such question? Yeah, that, 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 that's an excellent question. What's your name? Giselle. Okay, excellent, Giselle. So listen, what you do is that you look for the rubric. So the rubric for a weighting that is five to seven marks is different from the rubric that is um, that reflects a, a weighting for 12 marks. So the rubric for perhaps let's go five marks, maybe outline, define, account for. And that gives you an idea of what you are to do. It means you are to be brief. But here is what. If you outline your answer, so when, they, when, 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 when you're given the booklet and so on, and your, your question paper, find a space on the question paper, sometimes even your booklet, the, the first page, and you can outline it briefly. So you're looking now carefully and looking at, at, at this rubric five marks. Account for is simply, in a sense, an introduction. Five marks. So you know that you need one strong point. Some students might need two. And you're going to prepare in very, very succinct, very, very brief terms, right, of what it is you are to account for. So let's say an example, account for the Grenada Revolution. What they want is an account for it, meaning what is it? So accounting for it is asking you in a sense to define it. Now I know it's an event, so it, it's not as though it is defined, but it's more like conceptualized concepts that you put together, right? It's you like summarizing the entire revolution. Right. So you could say, well, the Grenada Revolution was an insurrection that occurred between the years 1979 to 1983 whereby the people's the new drill movement, I have to give you the distinction between the two, I'm sure Mr. Hall already did. So the new drill movement overthrew the government of Eric Matthew Gary and formed the people's revolutionary government. So I'm gonna say it again. The Greater Revolution was an insurrection that occurred between the years 1979 to 1983 in which let's call them the socialist Marxists, right? Political party, the new jewel movement overthrew the government of Prime Minister Eric Matthew Gary and formed the People's Revolutionary Government. 
right? And then you're going to give a, a few other details. But what it is is that you're not going into a deep discussion. And you remember that we talk about the story and we said, well, the story might be missing part. Well, when you, when you move on to a waiting that is about 12 marks, this is when you really get into the meat of the story now because you're going to give all of your examples and your evidence to, to, to support the point that, that you're making. But I'm saying to you that if you're able to cultivate the skill of outlining your paper, very brief, very, very brief, you have your little outline and you know, all right. So account for brief definition, brief concept, brief ideas, factors, etc., etc., that will give rise. Political, economic, social, you, 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 you kind of summarize. And then now you get into the meat of the matter, right? Outlining is an important strategy. So see this, let me show you a question um, before we, we, we really get there though. Any questions so far? Comments? Let me just return to that slide on, on strategies, even be, be before we get into um, tackling the question itself, right? Anybody, do you have any concerns, questions, anything that, you know, getting into this, the exam you think about? Or we're all good for now, because we got a few questions yes. before, quite great. Yes, go ahead, tell me who you are. Miss, I am Austin. Hi, Austin. So yes, I was saying that the end time I have like a essay or like an exam, a history exam, I always like go through the paper and see which questions I'm going to like, like I'm sh that I'm going to do for sure. So I just mark off the questions that I'm going to do. And then after I do that now, I find like a page and then for each question, I write the points that I'm going to put under those questions. So I, um, it's more easier for me when I do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Austin. Yes, I'm finished. Yeah, this is an excellent strategy there, Austin, because uh, what it would do is that it would concretize clearly in your head that uh, you've already identified your questions. And in that way, it would minimize as well some of the anxiety that students face when you finish the question and you now have to move on to the second or the third. Of course, this is not, you know, perhaps other students may have other methodologies and other students may, 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 may like to select questions as they go, but we generally advise you to read the entire paper first and then select uh, the question um, that you think you are best prepared to answer, right? It is not the question that you like. <laughs> the one that you are best prepared. I think some students, um, perhaps you have more of an inclination. Um, you're drawn more to, 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 to some questions, perhaps, you know? Um, and that as well is an indicator of, of really what you should deal with. Now, in, in, there is also, of course, the flip side, because there are times when students are drawn to questions um, because uh, not just because they feel comfortable but because uh, it is something that is known if you know what i mean it is a question that you know you would have heard about you've seen it you've heard other students talk about it um and you may not be fully prepared to answer it but be because there is a sense that it is known it is familiar right um we want to warn against that too you really want to select a question that you're you're really prepared to to to, to tackle based on how the question presents itself. Good. Um, so that was an excellent contribution there, Austin. So let us look at question 16, right? Um, and this is from a past paper, 2002 past paper. And the question is simply read the passage below and answer the section that follow. There is an excerpt. So you are to read this little passage and it says the people's revolutionary government of Grenada tried to create a new type of politics in the British Caribbean. The experiment ended prematurely in confusion. So students, let us identify the key terms. So just, just point out for me 
what the key terms are in the passage. Nothing to think about. So the revolutionary, people's revolutionary government of Grenada tried to create a new type of politics in the British Caribbean. The experiment ended prematurely in confusion. So students already, right? The first key terms there grouped together would be what? The People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada. Yes, that is the first thing because this gives you an idea that we're talking about the Grenada Revolution, but not just the Grenada Revolution, of what happened while the revolution was already in its course. They tried to create a new type of politics in the British Caribbean, giving us a sense that this revolutionary government did something that no other um, government had done to get into power. So it is giving you an indication of how they got into power. And you know that they got into power by doing what to the Eric Gary government? What did they do? Did they get into power constitutionally by, by, by going to the poll and, 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 and by having the people vote, vote them in? No, ma'am. Well, no. And, and, and to be fair, we, we know as well that there was an election right in 1976 and it is largely believed in the country that gary rigged the election good when the, the the people who formed the people's revolutionary government they had a political party so you, you already have that understanding the former government you must have a political party and they were very young you know young people in their in their very early 30s right when bishop became prime minister he would have been about 34. So in 1979, you're talking about young people um, in, in their very early 30s who formed a political party called the New Jewel Movement. People who were lawyers, people who had studied for their, 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 their LLB, people who were economists, people who had gone to the university in Hull in London, people who were strategists, people who were in the military. So we're talking about this government, the People's Revolutionary Government, and they tried to create a new type of politics. Is that a key word, students? A new type of politics. What do yes. you think? Yes. Yeah. So listen. So now you have to understand what is this type of politics? Anybody think that they have an idea of, of this type of politics that they try to create? You don't have to define, but you could conceptualize. Yes, go ahead. Could it be more like an authoritarian style of leadership or politics? That would be Eric Geary. He was the he was the the, the autocrat, right? But the Fair. hold on, the opposite of that. Democrat. Right. So yeah. it was seen as a democratic socialism is 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 what it was called of course there are some scholars who say it is a a marxist government so some of you have heard of the sociologist um, karl marx who has the idea that our government our nation state must be must have a communal arrangement but more than that the undergirding ideology is that the two forces in a society the bourgeoisie that is those who own the factors of production and the proletariat those who work for the bourgeoisie are always in conflict good marx believed though that what you must really have well he said well the proletariat would overthrow the bourgeoisie but underpinning this communist uh, socialist ideology is that the government provide social um, amenities you know and engage in social policies to advance the people good so it is not a capitalist government um, as let's say the USA, whereby the private sector um, has uh, you know, a strong hold on the economy. It is the government who provides uh, all of these social policies that bring social benefits 
And I'm giving you an idea already that perhaps one of the strengths of a government like that would be um, all of the social benefits because that is the, the, the ideology of, of, of that government, right? It has been called a participatory democratic socialism. But the excerpt tells us that the experiment ended prematurely in confusion. So this gives you an idea that the ending of this government came to an end, right? And when it ended, something went down. So when you see a term like confusion, you already know this, right? So you're not going into, let's say, into an exam if you decide to tackle such a question and, and you're not going bewildered, wondering, Lord, what is this confusion? No, you know this. So this is a key term, a key concept, a cue that the questions to follow will underscore elements of the passage. Good, it ended prematurely in confusion. So students tell me, what was this confusion? It sounds as if something grand went down. What went down? A revolution. A revolution, yes. What else? How did it end? Anybody remember? Miss, was it the um, coup that Bernard Coup carried out on the, what's his name? On Maurice Bishop. Yeah, Maurice Bishop, yeah. Right, so some kind of, so that is telling you we have ism, schism, infraction, infighting, fraction, right? In this people's revolutionary government. So we're going to talk about that. So students, the first uh, subsection of question 16 with a weighting of eight, eight marks. So already, you know that you're gonna have to do some writing. In other words, you cannot present two lines, three lines and secure eight marks. You're gonna have to give a full discussion, but not uh, three pages, <laughs> you know? So it wants three reasons why some Grenadians were unhappy with the Eric Geary government. In other words, it is asking you for conditions that make a revolution possible or the factors. So another way to ask this is give three factors that gave rise to the Grenada Revolution. Good. Um, three triggers, three symptoms, three conditions that give rise to the Grenada Revolution, three causes of the Grenada Revolution. So we want to know why Grenadians were unhappy with the Eric Geary government, eight marks. B is asking for the benefits that the People's Revolutionary Government tried to bring to Grenada. So it's asking you for achievements, but it is not asking you for achievements alone. It says try to bring. So if there is an initiative that they were trying to implement, you will also be awarded for that. So in other words, if there is an initiative that did not fully come to, to completion under their tenure, but that they were in, in you know, that they, they had implemented, it, it, it was being built or it was being erected, then you would also earn some marks for that. The next part of the question, and then we're gonna get into it. Discuss five reasons why the People's Revolutionary Government was removed from office. Good. So let's start with uh, question one. Reasons why Grenadians were unhappy with uh, Gary's government and a past paper from 2002. And it is asking you for three reasons. So students, a strategy for writing your paper and presenting your ideas is that you can use the thematic approach. So the thematic approach involves three strands or three threads. And what it does is that it groups ideas into broad thematic concerns. And here are the examples, the political reasons, economic reasons, sociocultural reasons. So what you're doing is that you are presenting arguments for the causes of the Grenada Revolution. Why the people were unhappy with Gary's government? Well, these, of course, um, give rise to the revolution. 
So you're grouping them into these ideas, political, economic, and sociocultural. And students, what the grouping does is that it distinguishes and demarcates ideas. So what you're not going to deal with a political idea under the economic, unless there is a link or an economic idea that should really be sociocultural. Now, if you're thinking about political, what comes to mind? If you're thinking about a political reason why a people in any country at all, this is now broadly speaking, would be unhappy with a government, what kind of ideas come to your mind? So let's say if I were to ask you, why is the people of Jamaica unhappy with the present government? Let's say, right? And as an example, you're, you are to present a political reason now. What kinds of answers do you think you're going to need to satisfy this political reason? I think you would honestly have to talk about the leadership. Yes, precisely. Go ahead, is that Austin? No, it's Mark, it's Kiana. Hi, Kiana, yes, very good, Kiana. I don't know how the Prime Minister leads the country, I'd talk about that. So listen, you already have the broad framework, right? So leadership style, somebody else wanted to come in on the mic, yes? Oh, Missy could talk about Oh, wait, no, you just said it. Never mind. Miss, I was going to say leadership style because sometimes they would say he listens too much or sometimes he doesn't listen at all. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes people have a mix up right there. Um, uh, uh, yes, definitely. Definitely. Miss, Anybody else? Miss, yes? Miss, could you also talk about um, if there's any political instability in going on in the country? Yes, very much back and forth. Um, government ministers resigning, you know, that kind of a thing. Of course, excellent instability. Yeah. Good, yes. Miss elections. Right. Elections. So we want to know whether elections are fair or whether we have election fraud, electoral fraud going on, whether, whether you know, vote buying, elections being rigged. Well, students, you've answered the question. But what about? What about the, the, the hemorrhage or the abortion, the suppression of freedom of speech, where people feel as though, is there any recent examples that you could think about where a few persons felt as though they were being victimized when they opened their mouth and talk? Let's put it in, yes, in basic yes. terms. Oh, so listen, you already have the framework for why it is a people in any space would be unhappy with a government and the, 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 the runnings of the political office. So you've just presented the political reasons, right? Now what you have to do is to cement now that those political reasons and connect it to the Grenadian context with Eric Geary. Leadership style is always an issue. So Eric Geary was a totalitarian, autocratic, dictatorial, some people call him a tyrant. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of the Duvaliers of Haiti, Papa Doc and Baby Doc, right? Dictators of Haiti in the 1970s. Now, a lot of uh, terror, terrorizing the people, policies that, that, that suppress the people's freedom of speech. Well, it's the same thing. Now, listen, Gary was so totalitarian and so dictatorial that uh, he would mix uh, his politics uh, with violence, right? So I'm giving you ideas, one leading into the other, political violence. So there was a culture of political violence and political victimization, something scholars call strong arm politics. By strong arm, we mean my way or no way, right? It's an extension of authoritarianism, being a dictator. If I don't get my way, I'm gonna victimize you. And I'm going to victimize you with the paramilitary and the military forces. Now, in Grenada, Gary had the Green Beast and the Mongols Gang, and these were paramilitary and military forces. They were called Mongols Gang because they used, I'm not sure if you know, of, of the machete. Um, 
colloquial, colloquially called the, the cutlass, right? Well, there is one of them that is called the mongoose. That is how it is called in Grenada, one of those machete. So that is what they used and they would brutalize any opponent, real suspected, whether it is in the imagination. Yeah? Gary would also breach the people's constitutional and political rights. So here is what he would do. He would fire opponents from, from, from their job. Imagine being fired directly from by the prime minister. Because he controlled every arm of the government, right? He controlled the legislative. He controlled the, the judiciary arm. He controlled every arm of the government. Good. Even something as a point in a teacher to a school, Gary controlled that. So we're seeing this high level of authoritarianism. And the other members of, of, of Gary's parliament had no say. Gary took control of every sector, every ministry, every manifesto, right? Every portfolio. So Gary's style was, I am the authority, right? He would suppress freedom of speech. And still there's one way to suppress freedom of speech. And listen, I say all the time that history is not monocausal and history is not fixed, is not stuck within this historical moment. You're going to see history right in front of you. Some people put it simply, history repeats itself. So in a day and age of COVID-19, across the world now, we're seeing that persons who engage social media are being threatened and suppressed. People are losing their jobs when they oppose how our government is treating with the COVID-19 pandemic, et cetera. Well, in Gary's day, he did not have the social media issue to deal with, but people would write in their editorials and their comments in the newspaper. So listen how he would suppress freedom of speech now. Gary would pass the newspaper act in and it would it would be called the, the um newspaper suppression act in 1975 whereby a simple editorial in the newspaper moved from nine hundred dollars to twenty thousand dollars so who have that kind of a money to oppose the government in the newspaper or to air their grievance right in that way he was suppressing the people's freedom of speech and then of course gary has also been accused of electoral fraud so the same political party that would overthrow gary the new jewel movement contested the elections in 1976 but it has been pointed out that the elections were rigged and although the people who had widely opposed Gary at this point, and see that when the people start to oppose him, politics, popular culture through the calypsos and the songs and the chants, you know, we shall juke him, we shall juke him down. G O go, Gary must go. You will come, Gary go. Gary go with UFO, etc., etc. When, 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 when the nation imagines its opposition through popular culture, then it is quite clear that the people were unhappy with the Eric Gary administration. Economic reasons. Gary, of course, would control the people economically as he was about controlling the people. So one such way was through a, a program called Land for the Landless. And it was a scheme in which Gary would transfer lands from people who oppose him to his supporters. People were unhappy with that. People were quite perplexed. People who had owned family lands for, for, for years and who had inherited lands, right, were the victims of this scheme land for the landless. Of course, uh, there were some who were quite happy with this because his supporters would have, of course, been the beneficiaries of, of this scheme. But those who lost land, the middle class and the landed class, the proprietors, they were quite disillusioned 
un and unhappy with, with the Eric Geary administration. The second thing he did, he abolished producer companies. So he passed what was called the Not Nutmeg Board Dissolution Order Validation Act, a very long act that was passed in 1975. Now, students, you know that Grenada is the island of spice, right? It produces nutmeg for export. And it is the second largest producer of nutmeg. Well, at least it had that title um, up to Hurricane Ivan. When Hurricane Ivan destroyed Grenada, we can know what happened. So the, the cooperative is a, a body of farmers, nutmeg farmers, who are in charge of the production and the distribution of nutmeg to various vendors, the persons who buy the nutmeg, right? Whether locally, regionally, or internationally. So when he dissolved the producer cooperative, what he did was that he dissolved the power of the nutmeg farmers who, of course, collectively formed this, this corporation, this, 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 this cooperative um, that, 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 that brought benefit to them. Over 10,000 nutmeg farmers were affected. And what I want you to do is to compute that with the, the population of Grenada. 10,000 nutmeg farmers were affected in a nation of 100,000. So when, if you do a, a, a quick calculation, those of you who do maths and statistics and so on, um, when you do a rough calculation, 10,000, let's say each farmer has a family of four, what kind of figure we're talking about, students? 10,000 by 40,000 40, persons who are affected because of the abolition of this producer cooperative. Yeah, 40,000. So what Gary did was that he controlled um, this nutmeg board. He controlled who nutmeg, who could buy nutmeg, how nutmeg was being imported to, to different exports to different territories, et cetera, et cetera. And that, of course, meant that more than perhaps half of the nation um, was affected by, 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 by this act. Economic fallout is another factor. Loss of jobs, unemployment crises, 75% of the nation was unemployed on that year. And then, of course, uh, we had this uh, um, experience, the economic experience of Gary's extravagance called Spandamania, meaning that Gary used the national purse, what is called money in the treasury, where the, the, the national money, state money, he used for his own personal aggrandizement. He bought land, he bought private homes, he, he spent extravagantly at, at hotels, he traveled using this, this, you know, of course the, there is a, an, a, a, a portion for the use of the prime minister, but Gary was extravagant. So he squandered it and hence this concept, squander mania. Now, by the time the New Jewel movement came to power, in 1979, only $24 was in the treasury, meaning that the nation, the independent decolonized nation of Grenada in 1979 only had $24 in the treasury. The nation only had $24 because of Gary's extravagance, right? So these are all economic reasons why the people would have been unhappy with uh, the Eric Gary administration. So when you think about economic, think again about all of the economic reasons why a people would be disillusioned or unhappy with a government. I want to ask you students about sociocultural reasons. I'm not sure time is against us. All right, so listen, let's pick this up again or um, in a, a taped recording. But it was really nice.
meeting with you all. I don't think an hour is sufficient, as I told Mr. Hall. So we would need a two hours. But still, it's really nice to have had this very brief session with you and hope we can meet again. It was nice, sir. Meeting. You too. <laughs> Sir, right, go, go, yes. Sir, answer the question. Meeting her again, we're meeting her again, sir. Answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> One second, ladies. The go ahead, Pamela Bartley. Okay, sir. <clears throat> On behalf of my colleagues and myself, I would like to convey my deepest gratitude to you. Dr. Candia Michelle Hall, for taking the time out of your diligent schedule to educate us on the theme of the Grenada Revolution and to provide elucidation to any pertinent queries we may possess. I am assured I voice for all when I declare the span of your knowledge has largely impacted us and we are immensely grateful that you have shared such wisdom with us to ensure that we go out into the world as begrudging, scholarly and prudent historians. Learning about events that have shaped our future and learning about events that has made us who we are as a Caribbean body. I think we can all agree this session has been as exciting as it is edifying, enlightening, and impactful. Finally, we will take all the responses and information you have bestowed upon us, enabling us to tackle our upcoming CSEC Caribbean History exam and exit said exam feeling confident and securing our distinctions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bartley, and thank you very much, students, with a, a commendation and vote of thanks like that. I'm definitely coming back, whether Mr. Hall agrees or not. So I'll just get one of your emails and we can have the session. We will talk again, students. Really great to have all of you. Um, and, and I'm happy that you were able to participate and, of course, share as well some of what you understand the Grenada Revolution um, to have been. So take care, have a great day, and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to link up again, as we say. All right, ladies. Thank you. For tomorrow's class, we are not meeting face to face. So you're going to get some a reading activity to do. Uh, I'm going to send the material in the Google Classroom, and then we're going to meet again on Thursday. All right? So, okay. Okay, so that's... Sir. That's the plan for the rest of the week. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell Hall. Bye, lady. Welcome, Mr. Hall. No problem. Bye, sir. Bye, sir.